So uh, my talk here is to give you a little insight into how, I, at least I think, uh, uh, culture influenced uh, the evolution of human genes in the uh, recent and perhaps not quite so recent uh, past. So what kinds of uh, evolutionary relationships between genes and culture might we imagine? There are several uh, modern proposals on the table that uh, uh, reflect uh, the old dichotomy between nature and, and nurtures uh, that uh, uh, propose, for example, that uh, uh, culture is really largely under the control of genes and natural selection on genes. The most prominent uh, uh, spokesman for this point of view, I think, is Edward Wilson, who has the this uh, proposed with uh, Charles Lumsden clear back in 1981 that a culture was on a kind of a, of a, a genetic leash that, uh, that natural selection acting on genes would give us a psychology that then uh, shaped uh, culture in ways that were uh, dictated ultimately by uh, the survival value for our genes. And so it would all boil down to a, a selection on genes. The opposite kind of uh, hypothesis is that uh, uh, cultural evolution at some point took over from genes in, in human uh, uh, evolutionary history, and genes no longer have uh, anything interesting uh, going on in terms of, uh, of evolution. And this is a, a common idea, and it's, uh, it's uh, perhaps uh, uh, tacit throughout most of the social sciences that social scientists don't have to worry about uh, genes and genetic evolution because it's all, all the interesting stuff is going on in culture. And the position that I uh, uh, defend and I'm going to talk about here is that uh, the relationship is, is much more uh, intimate between uh, uh, genes and culture, and in particular that culture often leads the gene culture coevolution process. So uh, cultural evolution creates novel environments, and then those novel environments exert selection pressures on uh, uh, genes. So that uh, uh, genes play, a, uh, excuse me, culture has played a very active role in the uh, 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 formation of our of human nature, if you want to think of it that way. So the old nature-nurture dichotomy really uh, has to be broken down into uh, three kinds of elements that are important in human behavior. First, genes, uh, second, culture, and, and third, uh, individual learning. So we, uh, the, we get the direct impress of the environment on ourselves, and then we get the, uh, the evolution of these two inheritance uh, uh, systems. Uh, part of this uh, depends upon the idea that uh, uh, culture is a form of inheritance. So it's a lot like genes in, in uh, uh, some important respects. You get your, your culture from other people, from your parents and from other people that influence you. Your uh, peers, uh, a large number of other people may influence you, but it, it has in common with genes that something is, is uh, uh, transmitted, that uh, uh, behavioral variants are acquired by imitation and teaching and, and spread among people people much like uh, genes uh, spread, but of course there are these uh, uh, dramatic differences. And one of the most important differences is that uh, uh, culture is a, is a form of inheritance of acquired variation. Uh, I mean, a, a meeting like this is uh, all about uh, uh, the inheritance of acquired variation. Those of us who speak think we've learned something uh, in our scientific work and we're trying to uh, teach it to you to convince you that uh, we've learned uh, something interesting. So uh, we're uh, an example right here, a laboratory example of, uh, of how that uh, system uh, works. We can also uh, uh, use the uh, much larger community of people than just our parents to acquire uh, our uh, culture from. So if uh, dad is a poor hunter or, or uh, mom can't weave a basket to save her soul, then we can learn from aunts and uncles and, and other people. And of course, uh, we uh, dramatically amplify that kind of thing in the modern world when, when formal teaching uh, comes along and we learn a large number of skills in formal settings uh, uh, by professional uh, uh, teachers. But nevertheless, the, the pattern that uh, uh, so struck Darwin of descent with modification is something that obtains in the cultural system as well as in the, the uh, uh, genetic system. And uh, so culture links learning and inheritance th through this uh, inheritance of acquired variation. And the important part of that is that it uh, means that cultures can evolve much more rapidly than, than gene pools. So it adds to natural selection. Uh, natural selection may still act on cultural variation, but uh, we add to it the ability to, do, to use learning and to use selective borrowing from other people to uh, uh, cause uh, uh, evolution to happen in a much more rapid uh, uh, pace.
So Darwin himself was already a pretty sophisticated cultural evolutionist, and uh, you can extract uh, passages from the Descent of Man, like the one I have here, in which he remarks that, uh, or it's really an opinion, that in highly civilized nations, natural selection is no longer so important, and the uh, uh, continuing evolution depends more upon uh, the teaching of children and good education, he says, and uh, high standards of excellence, uh, depending upon the best and the brightest, to uh, uh, acquiring culture from the best and the brightest, and, and these are then embodied in laws and customs that are taught directly to uh, uh, children. So this, uh, uh, he does, he just barely uses the word uh, culture in, uh, in the modern sense in one place, but uh, it's uh, full of ideas like tradition and customs that uh, are related to the modern concept of, uh, of culture. Unfortunately, The Descent of Man was an unduly neglected book, particularly after about 1900, and, and Darwin's influence was uh, 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 lost and for three quarters of a century or so. So how can we imagine that uh, culture could have a major impact on uh, human evolution, that we could be uh, uh, substantially uh, uh, made by uh, cultural evolution, even to the point of, of our genes uh, following, uh, adapting to cultures that we invent? Uh, so in the first place, uh, culture has been important for at least a quarter of a million years, probably be more like uh, two and a half million years. So uh, Allison's talk just before mine gave you a, a sketch of what we know about uh, about uh, that. Uh, and if cultural evolution is faster than genetic evolution, then culture is going to often play the leading role in the evolution of, of this uh, gene culture coevolution system, not, the, not a lagging role. But. So we have this long period of time in which uh, culture and genes interacted and in which the uh, cultural system could have played a leading uh, role. And so cultural processes create novel environments and, it, and then uh, such environments lead to selection on the, uh, the genes. So just to reiterate uh, uh, the uh, point of the previous speaker, we have this uh, uh, succession of uh, fairly sophisticated and increasingly sophisticated stone tools over that uh, long uh, two and a half million year longer period of human evolution. Now, uh, so what direct evidence do we have that uh, changed cultural environments uh, have imposed themselves uh, substantially on genes? Quite recently, we have made a major transformation in our environments, particularly in the uh, elaboration of agricultural subsistence systems, which have replaced uh, meat uh, largely in our diet by plant materials, and, and uh, we've done uh, things like invent dairying and, and generated uh, uh, an entirely new nutritional system for most human populations that no longer depend upon hunted and gathered uh, uh, resources. And, and this seems to have led to, uh, uh, when we survey uh, the genome looking for uh, events of, of strong selection in the gene, something we can do, uh, looking for selective sweeps, as the jargon goes, we can estimate the uh, age of these uh, sweeps by the amount of, uh, of uh, material on either side of the uh, allele under selection that have been uh, uh, dragged to near fixation by the uh, selective sweep of the target gene because of linkage. So we could take it, and then this linkage breaks down gradually over time. So it provides a kind of a molecular clock to date these uh, uh, selective sweeps. And at least if the preliminary data that's in the uh, Hawks and Harpending et al. paper in 2007 is indicative that there was a huge wave of, of change associated with, with agriculture. So that's uh, a recent very dramatic change. There are some quite convincing cases were actually known before uh, modern uh, molecular genetics. So in uh, human populations with dairying, most adults uh, uh, secrete lactase uh, uh, throughout their life and uh, can, uh, can digest the sugars in milk uh, uh, throughout their life. In, most, in other mammals, in most human populations, this gene is shut down about the time of weaning because it's no longer uh, useful. Only humans with dairying uh, get much milk uh, to drink after they're uh, weaned. There are many hemoglobin polymorphisms that uh, turn out to be adaptations to uh, uh, exposure to malarial parasites, and, uh, and these uh, polymorphisms uh, uh, are all seem to be quite recent because human populations seem not to have been dense enough to uh, sustain uh, malaria 
uh, as a specialist parasite on humans until the advent of agriculture. So this is another case of the imposition of an agricultural environment, in this case, uh, making humans dense enough to support diseases. Many other epidemic diseases have a similar history that uh, came to aff afflict humans after the development of agriculture in more dense populations. So there's a, uh, presumably going to turn out to be a large raft of these. Some of these things are, are much more spe speculative. So uh, there's some idea that uh, genes that affect uh, behavior might have been uh, selected by the advent of, of uh, of societies that are hierarchical. So there's a proposal that certain serotonin transporter genes that make people more tolerant of inequality have arisen in the last few thousand years as inegalitarian state level societies have replaced the egalitarian societies of our hunting and gathering days. And then the human dispersal out of Africa was presumably led by cultural innovation. So when people penetrated from tropical Africa, subtropical Africa, into uh, the uh, mammoth steppe into Europe and, and these other cold, even paraglacial environments, we, we built fires and, and made shelters and, and, and learned to make uh, highly tailored clothing. But uh, in addition, uh, uh, a considerable number of, of genetic adaptations occurred as we dragged our, as culture dragged us into these uh, novel environments. Skin pigmentation is a well worked out one in which uh, exposure to low UV environments, and particularly in Northwestern Europe, Northwestern Europe is the cloudiest uh, environment in the world, and, and so it's no, uh, and light colored skin allows uh, people to, uh, to uh, synthesize more uh, vitamin D. Adaptations to high altitudes, uh, uh, there's an interesting adaptation in Tibet in which uh, the, uh, the way in which uh, the humans respond to uh, low, low oxygen by producing uh, fewer red blood cells than they otherwise uh, uh, than the rest of us. Uh, it turns out that that uh, confers health advantages on on people living in high altitudes, and it's present in Tibet, uh, but not in the Andes. And the Tibetans, uh, Tibet was settled uh, well 30,000 years ago or so, and the Andes not until a, until a few thousand years ago. So the Andean people have not yet uh, acquired that ad adaptation, if they ever uh, would. A conjecture here then is that. Uh, Culture may have uh, played a big role in, in all of the uh, attributes of, of humans. And, and one particularly interesting one is, is human social behavior. So humans are, are docile, they live in these large groups. Allison already um, mentioned that. And, and so uh, might humans have uh, uh, acquired these uh, proclivities through some form of group selection. It's a, it occurred to people, uh, going clear back to Darwin, that people look like they've been selected as tribes, that we have <coughs> loyalty to tribes, we recognize a boundary of tribes, we uh, act altruistically towards other tribal members, we uh, behave honestly with other tribal members, not necessarily so honestly with regard to others. And, and Darwin thought, uh, and again in The Descent of Man has this little passage that suggests that that humans indeed are, are group selected. So this is uh, just a quote, I, you've had time to uh, glance at it uh, uh, from the, again, from the descent of man. So one of my uh, students uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Adrian Bell, uh, got the idea that uh, maybe we could look at the uh, variation between uh, human groups, uh, the genetic variation and the cultural variation, and put it on the same uh, scale. So the, the problem with selection among groups uh, from a genetic point of view is that, that uh, it's a little bit of migration uh, tends to uh, homogenize the, uh, uh, the genetics of the t of two groups. And, and it, uh, human groups are really not very different genetically, which means it's hard to imagine that the, uh, uh, the group selection process that operated on, on humans operated directly on genes. So there in the left of that diagram are the FSTs. This is a proportion of variance that's between groups relative to the total genetic variance in those bars on the narrow bars on the left. And you can see they're quite small. And the, the gray bars are the uh, uh, cultural variation based upon the World Values Survey. And you can see that it runs about an order of magnitude or uh, maybe a little bit more higher than, than the genetic uh, variation. So there's lots more uh, cultural variation to uh, work with. The genetic data is from Cavalli, Swartz, and colleagues' famous compendium of genetic uh, variation in human populations. So the, uh, 
the uh, picture then that we have is that humans could have evolved by gene culture coevolution, and humans uh, are essentially uh, then became a, a domesticated animal that uh, that uh, <coughs> we uh, uh, were uh, domesticated by. Uh, this cultural group selection process. So we still have these ancient uh, social instincts. We tend to dominate other people. People are, are, not, uh, are often selfish and, ne and they're often nepotistic. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, we also have uh, uh, tribal scale institutions and, and uh, uh, attitudes that, uh, uh, that allow us to have uh, uh, cooperation in much larger groups. So if, it, if there was uh, first cultural group selection and then primitive uh, uh, norms and institutions and uh, the evolution of, of emotions like uh, sympathy and patriotism and, and more docile uh, behavior uh, and the evolution of symbolic uh, group boundaries uh, that uh, certainly are very important in human groups. Then uh, we could uh, exert uh, uh, social selection on people who deviate from uh, from the rules of uh, society. This is something we uh, certainly do uh, uh, today. If uh, people don't obey the rules, they go to prison and uh, uh, p uh, people in prisons uh, don't have the same reproductive success as people out of prison. So there's social selection that, that way can be, can be very important. So uh, this is uh, uh, a picture of a, a chimpanzee brain and a chimpanzee testicles. Uh, the brains are on the right and the chimpanzee testicles are on, on the left. And uh, chimpanzee males are really rough customers. And, uh, uh, and part of the reason is that they're, you know, I mean, people think of human males, particularly juvenile males, as testosterone poisoned, but uh, uh, we got nothing on, uh, on chimpanzees. Uh, so. Uh, there's, uh, I can't, if any of you here are pathologists or know a pathologist or do with, deal with human anatomy, I'd love to have a picture that, uh, uh, of human testicles and brains that uh, uh, correspond to the, uh, to the, the uh, chimpanzee ones there. I haven't yet been able to pre persuade anybody that I know to, to do this. So the best I can come up with uh, is this uh, uh, picture here. My picture here with, uh, there's a human testicle, it's about the size of a walnut, I guess, and the human brain about three times the size of a, of a chimpanzee brain. And so you can imagine what that picture would, uh, would look like if, if I could put my hands on, on one. Okay, that's the end of my remarks. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.